Thank you so much, Rev. Paul, for the introduction. Uh, good morning to everybody. And it is good to see you here today, this morning. Why don't we look at a person next to us and maybe share our smiles and maybe greet each other a beautiful morning. And it is our prayer that we receive each other an encouragement and be an encouragement to others today. It is the Lord's Day. And we shall not forget that uh, we meet on Sundays because we believe that Sundays, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened on Sunday. And even as we come, we shouldn't forget that we have a living Savior. Amen? He is our God. We appreciate the Psalteries. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And the parents also who are here with us this uh, morning. And um, welcome. And um, today we are on the third chapter of the book, the second chapter, by the way, of the book of Acts. Now I'm the fourth uh, speaker of the, of the series. Chapter 1, we remind ourselves, is the chapter where the promise of the Holy Spirit's power is given to the witnesses. And chapter 2 is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel and the preaching of Peter. And before we unpack uh, chapter 2, uh, shall we bow our heads in prayer asking for God's help. Father, we thank you that you are here. And we thank you for your people are here. Lord, speak to each of our hearts. Make our hearts, O oh God, like a good soil so that your word can grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start with a story. One Sunday morning, a seminary student drove his car to the church. And as he was leaving his home, the rain started to fall, and the closer he was getting to the church, the harder the rain was coming down. And But he kept going, he kept driving. Then he passed someone walking on the street, on the sidewalk. And he pulled the car and motioned the pedestrian, please come in. The rain, uh, the rain is too strong. Now, the man, the pedestrian, opened the door and got in. And it turned out that the person walking the rain was his professor, was his teacher, Professor Jones, who taught theology at his seminary. Now, we see in the story a professor who is, who is committed and devoted to come to church on Sunday, even on stormy day, even on rainy day. And that's the difference of someone who is devoted to come to the church, of someone who is devoted to worship the Lord. Amen? Now, the book of Acts records a devoted church, a committed church. We find in this book, a true and committed disciples transformed by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in this book, we learn that when we do the ministry, we do it not by might, nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit. We talk a lot about the Holy Spirit when we open the book of Acts. Now, it reminds us that it is that Acts is not only the Acts of the Apostles. It is the movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, to enrich us with a book, with a series, the book of Acts is not only here, it is the movement, only the acts, but the movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, someone wrote about this, David Platts. He said, 
that the church is not a building to see or a place to sit. The church is a movement to join. There is no spectator in this movement. Everyone is participant with our spiritual giftings and talents. Welcome to the movement. Now, what about the church? It's a church empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the inside person, if you may, that makes us really devoted to Christ. The reason why a follower of Jesus Christ is sold out to Him is the person of the Holy Spirit inside. Do we have the Holy Spirit inside? Amen. He indwells our hearts. And this is our common ground, the Holy Spirit Himself. Now, when we open Acts chapter 2, we see the essential ministries of the church. The verb here, devoted, prokasterio, connotes a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. And here in this definition, we pick up three words. Number one is steadfast. Number two is single-minded. And number three is fidelity or faithfulness. And I, and I add, because it is impossible for us to be devoted to the ministry of the church unless we have the love of God to do His work. To be steadfast is to be strong in the Lord, to be stable, to be uncompromising, to be anchored in Him, and to be rooted in His Word. And to be single-minded means to be united. And in this unity of the body of Christ, we should remind ourselves that there is always appreciation of diversity. Faithfulness, this is amazing. Because faithfulness is God's communicable attribute in us. It is God's character in us. Our God is faithful, amen, so that we can say one, when we sleep at night, the morning will come because God is faithful. But we can be also faithful, just like our God. We can be faithful in relationships. We can be faithful in the church. We can be faithful in serving Him. To be faithful is to be constant. To be faithful is to be loyal in keeping what He has entrusted to us, especially the blessing to have the talents and our spiritual gifts. All of this express what it is to be devoted servant of the Lord. The early church during the time was steadfast, single-minded, and faithful. How are we devoted? Now, verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We find here the seven essentials I'm going to share with you where the church, where each one of us should be devoted. First of all, the early church was devoted to God's Word. They were steadfast. They were single-minded and faithful to God's Word. Now, the Bible commentary will say that the apostles' teaching are the New Testament, uh, in the New Testament is, uh, are the Jewish scriptures as well as the teachings of Jesus Christ and the revelations He gave to the apostles. Now, the Christian in the early church gave priority to God's Word. To have a genuine revival is bringing back 
God's word to its place. And it is about being steadfast and anchored in God's word. Now a husband and a wife were preparing breakfast. The wife protested, why do I always have to make coffee? And the husband said, because it is the wife's job. Uh, it is, is it true? <laughs> now the Bible doesn't say it. And the wife said, that is the man's job. That is what the Bible is saying. Where you can find it in the, in the scripture. And, you know, the wife said, here, Hebrews. Hebrews, that means tim, tim plakape. <laughs> now, if it, it ever happens in your conversation, don't quote me on that. <laughs> That's a funny story, but you know what? You may agree with me that coffee is a very good partner to Bible reading. Isn't that true? Now, a steadfast Christian gives priority to God's word. When the storm of life is strong, he is able to stand because she anchors herself in the word of God. You know, another place that uh, we can find God's word is in our access group. Access is a place to be single-minded in God's Word. We can exercise that in our groups. When we talk about life in access groups, we strengthen and reinforce each other with the Word of God. Now, faithfulness is not only about reading the Word of God. It is about interpretation of the Word of God, and it is about application of God's Word. Now, Paul the Apostle exhorts Timothy, his protege, preach the Word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. You know, we devote ourselves to something we love. Is it not true? So that many times David wrote in Psalms his love for God's word. His love for the, God's precepts, God's law, and God's commandments. Now, we speak and share God's word because of our love for it and for our love for the Lord. The people devoted themselves in the word of God. And secondly, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship is essential in the church, especially in the body of Christ. There is a significant number of verses in the Bible that talks about fellowship. The one another verses, you know. Some people we call, call fellowship the one anothering. Are you one anothering? in your access groups. Now, the early church loves to fellowship with each other because they are devoted to each other. It strengthens the faith of every believer. There is a spiritual aspect of fellowship, and we remind ourselves of that, that the light cannot fellowship with the darkness, and that is what that is what Jesus said. It is the fellowship of those who are in the light of Jesus Christ. Another important of aspect of fellowship is the ministering to one another. And, you know, there are verses that remind us to bring these things to fellowship. 
we bring in the fellowship, we bring encouragement, we bring comfort, we bring sharing, tenderness, compassion. And when we come to church, we bring like-mindedness, we bring love. These are the things that we do not forget. When we gather as a family of God, do not forget to equip ourselves with these things. Maybe someone would say, Pastor, it's as if you, forget, you forgot something. What is that? How about the food? <laughs> we bring food in the fellowship. It's not bad. Jesus himself eat a lot of times. And some commentator would say that Jesus was a party person and just talk to people. It's not bad to have food in our fellowship. Now, a teacher of the school gave an assignment to his class to bring an object that represents the church. So someone brought a cross, crucifix. Someone brought the Bible because the, this is the center of the church, the Word of God. And eventually, strikingly, someone brought a casserole. And he is saying that this represents my church teacher because we are a philosophy in church. You know what? When we fellowship with each other, fellowship can heal a wounded heart. Do you know that in every conversation that we have, even in this church, can, may heal a broken heart? Every conversations are actually mutual counseling sessions. Do you believe in that? So when we come to Christian assembly, we should always remember that Christian assembly is not only vertical, something vertical. It is also something horizontal. We do not only come to listen to the Lord, but to encourage one another. And when we say, I am not encouraged with my church, maybe God brought you here to encourage someone. So that is the purpose why we have to meet regularly. Encouragement must be abundant within the body of Christ who loves to fellowship with each other in the name of Jesus. Thirdly, Devoted to the breaking of bread. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, we call it communion. Why join communion? Because in joining communion, we identify ourselves to be part of the body of Christ. We join, we are present at the Lord's table because we are part of the family. As much as possible, we shall be at the Lord's table participating in the Holy Communion. We must be single-minded and faithful in communion because it is where we thank God for the salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, just as the Israelites were freed from death and Egyptian bondage, we gather as a family celebrating our freedom in Jesus Christ. When God redeem us from sin and death. Now, other churches call communion Eucharist. And Eucharist actually simply means thanksgiving. Because that should be the atmosphere of partaking the communion. It should be celebrated in the spirit of thanksgiving because of God's salvation. And the next one is devoted in prayer. 
praying together is fundamental in the life of the church. The upper room was very important to the early church. It's a place where they meet in prayer. The church in the New Testament is a praying church. And the church in our time must be a praying church. If we do not, if we, we are not sure what we are going to do with the church, pray. We cannot be wrong when we pray because God's house is a house of prayer. Amen? And most of the, most of the churches actually, maybe 80% or 90% started in a prayer meeting. Is it not amazing? And Jubilee is one of them. Now, if I heard it right, our church, Jubilee Evangelical Church, was started with a group of praying women. Now, in one of the church prayer meetings, Sister Lilibeth shared with us her testimony. Actually, she's the person assigned to build the gallery of the history of the church at the fourth story of the new building. And as she was gathering the pictures, she was surprised to learn that few of the women who started Jubilee Evangelical Church came from China, where the church or the churches were persecuted. Now, the founders of this church stood for Jesus Christ. When they came to our country, they did, not, they did not give in to complacency. They shared the gospel. They brought the gospel with them and shared it to others and built the church. Now, this church is built with true commitment. We are not persecuted church, but still... We need to stand for Jesus Christ amid comfort, amid the freedom that we enjoy, amid prosperity, because sometimes prosperity can be more dangerous than persecution. It brings us away from our first love. Now, number five, fifthly, they were devoted in worship. Verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe and wonder. Now, if you look at 46 and 47, it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, praising God. You know, awe and wonder for who God is, is a response to genuine worship. Without awe and wonder to a holy God, there is no worship. God's presence through the Holy Spirit gave the church awe and wonder. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, the church is full of awe and wonder. When people come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church rejoices and filled with awe and wonder. And when people grow and transform, we are amazed. What is your response to God's presence this morning? Does it bring us to worship? Does it not bring us to sing to the Lord? What is your response when He speaks through His Word? What is our response when His blessings are abundant? What is our response when we are broken? We come to Him and even worship Him in the brokenness of our lives because He is the Almighty God, the Sovereign God. Sixthly, they were devoted in generosity. Verse 44 says, 
And everybody uh, can read with me. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Uh, do you like this verse? What if someone will come and say, uh, let us sell our property and give it to the church? <laughs> the early church is super devoted to generosity for God's work. One of those who sold his property is actually Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And a verse says that he sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. He was not only an encourager in words, but he is encourager. He was encourager in the giving for the kingdom of God. But maybe some of us will, will ask, is it normative, Pastor? Since we find it in the church, does that mean that we apply it in our time right now? Definitely not for a number of reasons. Firstly, because this happened during the Pentecost, the formative stage of the church, and it never happened again in the early church. Secondly, it was good during the time. This phenomenon happened during the Jewish feast when people from different places came to Jerusalem and eventually heard the message and they believed. And God put it in the apostles' heart, in the heart of the followers of Jesus Christ to provide and care for these people because they come from other places. This is amazing because today, God still places in our hearts and the heart of the people to be generous to God's work. There are people who keep giving and giving to the Lord's work. And all we can say is praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord. Generosity. Generosity is uh, to the Lord's work is an eternal investment. It is storing up treasure in heaven. But what is amazing here is that generosity is not only a privilege for those who have. It is a privilege for everyone. The rich can give as well as the widow with the two coins. Is it not amazing? So that means everybody can, can make eternal investment. Now, God wants us to be good steward of God's wealth. And we will continue to be faithful to what is due to the Lord. Lastly, number seven, devoted to the Great Commission. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Aside from the 3,000 the Lord added to the number daily. Church growth is the Lord's doing. Our part is to be single-minded, to be devoted, and to be faithful to what God has entrusted to us. But at the same time, this could not be a, a principle and something happens. Because at the same time, we need to be intentional in sharing God's love and in discipling others. That is why the church, I believe, built the access groups. Evangelism and missionary works are intentional. Now, my brothers and sisters, these are the seven essential ministries of the church. The early church did and we keep doing and there can be more every ministry of the church is essential now another place 
these ministries are found is in our access group. The balance of these ministries is the measure of a healthy church. When we talk about the church, we think also of our family because the church is a family. Now, before I ask how devoted are we in the church, this is an important question to each one of us, both young, uh, young and young. How devoted are we to our family? Now, one thing we must always be grateful is that Jesus Christ is devoted to redeem us from sin and death. You are bought with the price of the blood of the Lamb. You are bought by Jesus Christ. Can we say that to the person next to us? You are bought by our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. And it makes sense to devote ourselves in serving Him, in God's family, and in even in our family. Now, going back to the story, the student and the professor. Now, while in the car, as we remember, he brought the professor in the car. And professor, he asked, Professor Jones, Are you, uh, are you do doing, what are you doing on a day like this? And Professor Jones said, well, it is Sunday and I'm on the way to church. Do you know that it's raining and it's raining hard? Why did you decide to come to the church? And Professor Jones answered and said, I didn't decide to come to the church today. I decided to come to the church 50 years ago. To be devoted is to make a decision. And he said, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I have decided to be faithful in him. My brothers and sisters, the time that you gave your life to the Savior, you made a decision to be steadfast, to be single-minded and faithful in Him. The questions are, how devoted am I to God's Word? How devoted am I to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, in prayer, in worship, in generosity, and to the Great Commission? Now, as we live in the light of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, are we able to stand? How devoted am I to the church? And sometimes, just as we said, we are not devoted until we say to the Lord, I love you. And I love you, and because I love you, I want to serve you. I want to be faithful in you. There's a song that says, I love you, Lord. A very simple song, and I lift my voice. And even as we respond to the message, we will sing this song and commit ourselves to be faithful in Him, to be single-minded, and to keep on doing what we are doing right now. Shall we all stand and we will sing the song, I love you, Lord. Is that familiar? I love you, Lord. Everybody. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to you oh my soul rejoice take joy my king in what you hear 
May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. And Lord, we want to say we love you. Father, help us to love you more. And Lord, we ask that you will continue to work in our hearts, O oh God, that we may love each other as a church. And Lord, we pray that you may strengthen us as we continue to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive this benediction from the Lord. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And God's people say, Amen. seated for a few moments of personal prayer and reflection. God bless you. <laughs> 